coming from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I think Rhonda already took care of the sermon in her communion meditation, so we can all go home now, right? I'm just kidding about the last part, that I can't go home. And Tom, I'm watching you, no sneaking out the door. I remember learning from my high school economics teacher that nothing in life is free. Everything has its cost. And this is very important to understand. Especially in this day and age, it's not uncommon to hear complaints or even to complain ourselves about today's generation being spoiled and feeling entitled to whatever they want. And even as we complain, a lot of us are guilty of contributing to it as parents, as grandparents. We give kids what we want them to have. Or we give them simply what they want to have for a variety of reasons. You know, some of us have had uh, tough upbringings and want them to have everything that we didn't have growing up. Some of us are very busy working a lot and give them things to make up for lost time. Some of us want the kids treated like the princes and princesses that they are in our hearts. And of course, for grandparents in particular, it's fun to spoil the kids rotten and then send them home to their parents to deal with. Maybe as a bit of revenge for the trouble your kids gave you as they were growing up. Whatever the case, with all of this giving going on, it's easy for the recipients of those gifts to believe those gifts are not just free to them, but totally free. And it's not, and you know, it's hard to understand for them 
What had to take place in order for those gifts to be given so freely? Somebody had to buy it. Somebody had to pay for the materials to make it. Somebody had to pay to have those materials put together. Somebody had to pay to get that product where you could access it. Of course, with our desire to give, we have a responsibility to teach this very, very important lesson about all that goes into that free gift. At some point in life, we come to really understand this lesson that we've got to earn our way. We've got to work to earn the money that pays for all of those things, gifts and necessities alike. In today's passage from Paul's letter to the Romans, we find a continuation from last week. Now, you may remember... Uh, that Paul was addressing the question, since grace abounds, how about we just continue living in sin? To which his answer was, uh, no. And he says something very similar. Um, since we're living under the law, let's go ahead and continue to sin. Uh, no, you're living under grace now. Paul went on to encourage us, as we find especially in this passage, he's encouraging us to live in the light, to live lives of grace, to live lives of righteousness, to enter into the eternal life that God provides and embrace it fully, to live in righteousness in response to it. In today's passage, he is continuing with this message saying, do not let sin exercise dominion over your mortal bodies. Do not let it have that control over you to lead you to live sinfully. The issue about sin exercising dominion is a very, very serious matter to consider. The way he describes it, we are slaves either to sin or we're slaves to God. Now you, remember, you may remember some words of Jesus here saying that you can either serve God or you can serve wealth. Can't serve both. Remember too that it was said that the root of all evil is the love of money. You can't serve both. You can only serve one or the other. You can serve God or you can serve your love for money. This is a lot like that, except Paul puts it in even more simple terms. You can either serve God or you can serve sin. You can't serve both. Serve one or the other. One or the other has dominion over you. Paul also explains that before you found God in Jesus Christ, you were serving sin, but you didn't have any choice. You were a complete and total slave. You didn't know any better. But God came into your life and offered you a free gift, a gift of grace. Through that grace comes eternal life. Even though through Christ we become slaves to God, as Paul explains it so well here, yeah, I would use that word slave lightly. Because as we're finding here, as we've been set free from sin, we're not forced to serve God. We have a choice. The freedom from sin that God gives means that we have come to know the truth. We have come to know the difference and we now have the choice of what we're going to do. Are we just going to fall into the sinful ways of the world or are we going to be obedient to the will of the Lord? As we gain the freedom to choose between serving sin and serving God, uh, we now have a great responsibility to decide and to live into our decision. Now, if we continue to be slaves by sin, it's slaves to sin, it's by choice. While we know the difference, yet still choosing sin. There are more than a few Christians out there who've made that choice to continue serving sin, even though proclaiming faith in Christ. And even Christians out there who have been tricked into believing that they are living lives of righteousness, meanwhile continuing to be mean and judgmental and abusive and taking advantage of others. And not to sit here and point fingers, 
probably a majority of us also fall into trouble with this. As many of us are good and loving toward those who are good and loving towards us in return. Meanwhile, having nothing but hate and disgust for our enemies. Choosing to serve God involves doing even the most difficult of what God would have us do. To consciously choose the opposite of what God would have us do, such as, you know, loving your enemies. If we choose to hate our enemies, decisions like that cause us to start slipping back under the dominion of sin. We've got to understand as much as possible who it is that we are choosing to serve, what it is that we are taught to do, and how to be obedient. We've got to understand who we are, what kind of life we're choosing. And as we commit ourselves fully, not just halfway, but all the way to who it is that we are serving, that is when we truly fall into uh, the, the light of God receiving that grace and the fullness of eternal life. That's when we truly experience as we, obe as we are obedient to God as fully as we humanly can. As Paul said, this freedom to choose between God and sin is certainly a free gift. But as talked about already, nothing in life is really free. This includes God's free gift. Just as Rhonda was saying about the freedom in this country, that it's not free. A lot of sacrifice has gone into providing this freedom. Same thing with God's free gift. It's free to us. It's completely free to us. It's given on God's behalf. But we often mistakenly think um, that we have to earn this free gift in some way. But there's no earning grace. We have to earn everything else in life, but there's no earning grace. And then once we realize that we don't have to earn it, and that we can't earn it, we might then mistakenly fall into thinking that grace is totally free, and that there was nothing that really had to go into giving it. It was just a completely free all around. Well, we didn't do the work for it. We didn't pay the cost, and we couldn't if we tried. But God did. There's nothing free about it on God's end. God bears with us with endless patience. God sent Jesus Christ to be the one God would work through to get this grace train moving. By God's power and strength, Jesus chose to give his own life to be obedient and to give his own life for that grace to be shared with the world. And through Jesus' resurrection, we are the ones who keep that grace train moving forward. That we might think of that obligation to carry on Jesus' work to be a requirement for grace, it's not. And it's not a way to earn it. Doing good is not a requirement for grace. Doing good is a product of grace. Living lives as people of the light, that's a product of grace. That happens in response to the free gift that we give. That comes out of our appreciation for what we've received. God has freely given us this grace, charging us nothing. We didn't earn it. We're not entitled to it. But God has chosen to give it to us freely. If we have fully received and embraced that grace, we will certainly choose to use the freedom we've received to choose God over sin, to give our total selves to the work of the Lord. The result is a very strong one. As Paul describes, the result of sin is death. It leads nowhere. Pain and suffering to the end. Leads to suffering, abuse, negativity, hurt feelings, loneliness, emptiness, nothing but trouble. But yet to choose God leads to eternal life. It leads to mercy. It leads to compassion. It leads to forgiveness, positivity, companionship, fulfillment, healing, and peace in the world. Such as those who the world has left for dead. To be welcomed and loved. Like the child we're sponsoring as a community. Choosing God leads us to reach out and provide for folks like that. And therefore to experience eternal life 
with this young man all the way across the world. May we give ourselves to understand as fully as humanly possible who we are, who it is we're choosing to serve, who it is we are choosing to be. May we make our choice and follow through with our entire being. May we receive the gift that God has done so much to give freely to us. May we live in righteousness. May we experience eternal life. Amen.